Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a little editorial about the latest developments coming from Chicago. It seems that the Ken doll of classical music, Klaus Mekala, will be taking over as the new music director. Now, to claim that the 28-year-old conductor is qualified for this job is a complete and total joke. It's a farce. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. The orchestra's PR machine, of course, is going to claim otherwise. And we're going to hear some of the usual garbage that we uh, associated with these sorts of appointments, but we have to simply set that aside. In order to understand what's going on in Chicago, um, I'd like to take a little walk down memory lane because this has all happened before. Those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And I specifically mean this happened in Chicago in 1950 when another unqualified conductor, Raphael Kubelik, took over the orchestra and lasted for three years. Now, the circumstances aren't exactly the same, and we can analyze them afterwards. But I want to share with you a couple of articles written by Claudia Cassidy, the notorious Chicago critic who was blamed as the wicked bitch of the Midwest for ch chasing Kubelik out of Chicago after a mere three years. Mekala's contract initially will run for five, and it begins, I don't know, what was it, 25, 26, or 26, 27? Technically, but it'll be like hovering around between now and then as the such-and-such -such conductor of something or other. There's a title. It doesn't make any difference. But I really would like would like you to understand what's going on there when you have a young, untested conductor. You say untested. Oh, he's got the Concerto Bell. He's got the Orchestra de Paris, de Paris. He's got the Oslo Philharmonic. Yes, he does. But he's 28, and there is no way in hell he knows more music than the orchestra does. They are going to be teaching him. And if Chicago wants to spend millions of dollars letting this guy acquire his education. So by the time he's in his 40s or 50s, he may be qualified to stand before a major orchestra. Well, that's their problem. I mean, that's their choice. It really is. Now, of course, there's always the possibility that he's a musical genius. But I can tell you, based on his recordings, He's no genius. <laughs> so far, they've sucked. Um, I haven't seen him live. I heard he's better live. A lot of people are better live. I, I assume that, that you know, when he's in front of an audience, he can do things that are not going to pop out on in the more controlled circumstances of the recording studio. That's probably true of most artists, though. That's not particularly special, and I don't trust anybody who tells me how wonderful a concert is unless I've heard it myself. Um, so I'm not going. we're not going to go there yet. We're going to get there because it's relevant. But in the meantime, let us, let us go back a few, few decades, a century and a half, is it 70 years or so? Yeah, 70 some odd years and see what the situation was. Excuse me, dear. I'm having a cat issue. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. Get out of the way. Thank you. That's Mildred. She wants to play fetch. All right. You ready? Go. Thank you. Okay, so let's see what Miss Cassidy had to say about Raphael Kubelik, who was 35 when he got his appointment to Chicago, and Mekala is even younger than that. So let's start with a couple articles here. First, this is from, let's see, what's the date? Uh, February 12th, 1950. Sales psychology is often a baffling business, and it has taken a curious turn of late in the official domain of Orchestra Hall. In announcing the engagement of Raphael Kublik as the Chicago Symphony Orchestra's next conductor, Edward L. Ryerson, president of the Orchestra Association, said he is confident that Mr. Kublik will make, quote, music that will be enjoyed by all who come to listen in the receptive spirit of goodwill, unquote. More recently, on a radio program called Your Symphony Scrapbook, George A. Kuiper, the orchestra's manager, and Len Arnold, its press agent, set forth as two prime requisites for enjoying symphonic music, quote, good humor, unquote, and, quote, open-mindedness, unquote. If all these gentlemen will permit an interested outsider to say so, they are talking through their official hats. 
The receptive spirit of goodwill, good humor, and open-mindedness have exactly nothing to do with the subject at hand, which happens to be good music. Nor is it good propaganda to suggest that Mr. Kubelik, like the late, late Frederick Stock, Stock, you know, at the time of his appointment to the orchestra's post, is a talented young man who can grow up with the orchestra. Mr. Kubelik's talent remains to be discovered, but the analogy is a risky one. When Stock succeeded Theodore Thomas, the orchestra was in its 14th season. It had a high reputation and a low budget. The total cost of the 13th season had been slightly more than $131,000. When Kubelik takes over next October, the orchestra will be starting its 60th season. Since Stock's death, with the brilliant exception of Arthur Rudzinski's stormy engagement, which had a scant three months of constructive work before the explosion, the orchestra's reputation has gone down as its costs have gone up. The 1948-49 season cost more than $691,000. Although ticket prices have been held down by main force, they represent a sizable investment. One occupant of a seat allotted to newspaper reviewing, reckless enough to approve of that growing up with the orchestra business, to an old line subscriber was sharply snubbed with, quote, you watch him grow up from free seats if you want to. It cost me $93, unquote. The plain truth is that the audience, and I suspect the orchestra, needs to be reassured. Morale in both cases is shot to smithereens. It doesn't fool anybody to whistle in the dark. One favorite bit of nonsense now being peddled by way of optimism is that playing for all these guest conductors has made the orchestra a wonderfully responsive instrument. The fact is that the orchestra has become so woefully rusty, not to say bulky, an instrument, that most of its guest conductors are tortured examples of Freudian frustration. So anyway, that's the bottom line, right? He's coming in and uh, he's going to... Kubelik is taking over an orchestra that's, well, let's just say, they would say in transition when it's not at its best. And here's the end of that article. As matters stand, Mr. Kubelik is coming to a rundown orchestra with a restive audience with no more to back him up than a mutual memorandum of understanding, the sort of thing Rodzinski discovered to be an elusive term indeed when this high post was shrugged off as just another employee. When his high post, pardon me. Although Kubelik was not my choice, and even his most ardent advocate will admit that his engagement is a risk, I wish the trustees had seen fit to give him precisely the contract given the first conductor, Theodore Thomas. It went like this. The musical director is to determine the character and standard of all performances by the association, so and to that end, make all programs, select all soloists, and take the initiative for arranging all choral and festival performances. The intention of the association being to lodge in the hands of the director the power and responsibility for the attainment of the highest standard of artistic excellence in all performances given for the, by the association. Forget about a good-humored, open-minded, receptive audience. Give Kubelik the power and hold him responsible for attaining the highest standard of artistic excellence. If he even comes close, the audience will be on his side. So there we go, right? Young guy, relatively unknown, yes, and he's taking over the orchestra for the first time. Um, and hopefully, well, actually, Kublik had been there a few times before. Um, it didn't make much of an impression, actually. And now let's also take a look at what happened when Kublik arrived, which is quite interesting. Um, and then we can draw some comparisons between what was going on then and what was go and what is going on now with Chicago's music director designate. The Chicago Symphony Orchestra has dealt itself a new hand. This is from the, uh, let's see, let me just make sure we the article, October 1st, 1950, just before Kubelik's season began. The Chicago Symphony Orchestra has dealt itself a new hand, presumably with diamonds as trumps, this being the 60th or diamond jubilee season, to be encased as of Thursday night, October 12th, in newly decorated and relighted Orchestra Hall. Raphael Kubelik takes over as the fifth permanent conductor in the orchestra's history, permanent being a whimsical term orchestras employ, along with their most earnest poker faces.
George Schick will be on hand as the new assistant conductor, but will make his debut as pianist when Mr. Kublik presents Hindemith's The Four Temperaments at the first Saturday Night Pop concert on October 14th. Edward von Bynum of the Concertgebouw will be a new guest conductor, and Leonard Bernstein will be new on the Downtown Subscription Series, though he has conducted the orchestra at Ravinia. New to the subscription list of soloists are the singers Kirsten Flagstad, Boris Kristoff, Suzanne Donko, Blanche Thibaume, and Richard Tucker, the cellist Pierre Fournier, the pianist Ellen Ballon, and the violinist Louis Kaufman. Many of the favorite familiars are returning, but there is no doubt that a new hand is riffling the deck in Orchestra Hall. This can be a, provo a provocative gesture, and it seems that the Chicago, that, the, that Chicago, uh, that, let me see, and it seems to me that Chicago both I, oh, I'm sorry, and it seems to me that Chicago both eyes it warily and profoundly wishes it luck. The wariness comes of being stuck with the wrong conductor for seasons and being arbitrarily deprived of the right one in the face of violent public dissent. He's, she's speaking of Rodzinski's brief tenure. The goodwill comes of the general hopefulness and of a supreme weariness with procrastination and the obligation of clearing up the mediocre muddle of Chicago music. If Mr. Kublik gives us interesting concerts, he will find himself among friends. They look interesting on paper. Obviously, Mr. Kublik spent a long time pondering the standard repertory, contemporary music, and rarely heard music before he made up his programs. The question will be what he does with that music, for it is up to him not, o not only what, but how the orchestra plays. This is a major challenge, for Mr. Kublik has been given high place. Far more important to the conductor and to Chicago, it is a major opportunity. For my part, I prefer to walk in Orchestra Hall opening night as if that were, in truth, the beginning. It won't be, of course. Kubelik was here for three weeks of concerts last season, and I had previously heard him conduct at the Edinburgh Festival. In those performances, his work seemed to me lyrical and spirited, but lacking in breadth and depth. Right about, right about here, one faction says, he's young, just 36, give him time. And the other counters, he's been conducting for 15 years. How much time? Anyway, uh, they, then we talk about what the season's going to be like. Mr. Kubelik will conduct the first 12 weeks of concerts and eight weeks at the end of the season. Eugene Ormandy conducts the first and second weeks in January with Vladimir Horowitz as his soloist in the Tchaikovsky Concerto. Leonard Bernstein conducts the third and fourth weeks in January. Edward von Bynum, the first week in February. Ernest Alsermay, the second and third weeks in February, with Ellen Ballon as his piano soloist. And Bruno Walter conduct, conducts the Mozart Requiem, March 29th and 30th. So, I mean, one of the things that people talk about, of course, is how, is how you know, she ran Kubelik out of Chicago. But, of course, look at what he faced. Look at the guest conductors who are coming in, and you got this 35-year-old guy learning his trade at the expense of the Chicago audience. So Cassidy, this isn't about Claudia Cassidy, but she was right to insist on two things, and they are both applicable to Klaus Mekela's tenure in Chicago. Number one, the orchestra deserves the best, period. Kubelik wasn't the best. Neither is Mekela. Who are we kidding? He's just starting. And he's starting today in this crazy world. He gets all of these major orchestras, all these major appointments. You're going to have a situation, or you might have a situation, just like you have with, with Andres Nelson's in Boston. The guy's burnt out. I mean, totally burnt out. I mean, he had the Gavant House. He conducted Beethoven in Vienna. He's making recordings with everybody. And then how much time has he got with his nominal orchestra in Boston? Well, we'll see what happens with Mechel as he's running around the globe. Things are a little bit different now in that sense than they were then. But the truth is, he is inexperienced. Period. 28. No question about it. And he's taking over an orchestra that has vastly more experience than he does. So there's that point. The second point that I want to make, and I think that it's, it's equally, equally significant, is that Mekela is not going to face the same kind of, of competition that Kubelik did. Because who are the great conductors today? I mean, the world-class conductors. 
when you have you know von Bynum and Bernstein and Anselme and Bruno Walter, <laughs> these people coming coming to your orchestra, and you're the nominal music director, and they're all better known than you are. That's a problem. Today we don't have superstar conductors because what's happened is that. Well, let me put it to you this way. One of the things that people say about orchestras is that orchestral sound has become homogenized. The standard of playing is extraordinarily high. The Chicago Symphony is in much better shape now than it was in 1950. They can do anything. They're an amazing ensemble. But the sound of orchestras has kind of homogenized as players from all over the world go everywhere. The great schools of musical performance and tradition have disappeared. The local traditions have disappeared. This is a good thing and a bad thing, right? Quality is up, distinctiveness is down. And some people you know, value that more than others, but we don't have to make a judgment call on that line. The same thing has happened with conductors. What happens with conductors? Instead of spending a lifetime building an orchestra, imbuing that orchestra with their distinctive character and way of doing things, they spend you know, 16 weeks, a few weeks in with their, their nominal orchestra. And then they take the same programs that they've prepared for that year and they go jetting off and they do them all over the place. And nowadays, orchestras that have recording programs record those things and you get the same re guy doing the same stuff with different orchestras. It's like, it's loony. It's absolutely loony. But conductors sound much the same. And the the great conductors, the powerhouse conductors are gone they're gone for any number of reasons. I mean, there are better conductors than Klaus Mikkela out there. Far better. I mean, I can list a few. Manfred Hoenig, I mean, let's see, Pavo Yarvi, uh, Johan Folletta, um, Theodore Kuchar, uh, you know, Esapekka Saladin, although his business in San Francisco it seems not to have gone too well. But yeah, there are there are many, many other conductors. Even the New York Philharmonic, which I guess is getting Dudamel now. I mean, Dudamel has paid his dues in Los Angeles. I mean, he's got the experience. You may not like him. He may be a mediocrity, but he, he put in his time. And Mekola hasn't even done that. And now he's going to be taking over Chicago. Maybe when he finally gets the job, he'll have had a couple more years to learn, some, learn a few things. But, uh, you know. We shall have to see. And also what's very different these days, so Mekola won't have the same, you know, intimidation factor by way of comparison, but also the orchestra's PR machines um, are so much more vociferous now than they were then. I mean, you heard Claudia Cassidy mention, you know, they had one PR person. Now they have a division. And these, these people do nothing but put out positive press and slant everything to try and create a cult of personality um, around somebody who A, may not have any personality and B, isn't even there long enough. It's all, it's all just, just smoke and mirrors, quite frankly. Um, but he'll be the benefit of that. He will definitely be the benefit of that and the audiences will go and they'll give them the standing ovation and we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see if the ticket and subscription sales you know, sort of support the thrillingness of having him pop in and see what he's doing that can make him a, a local media star. It has nothing to do with music, with the quality of the music, because that's what Claudia Cassidy was emphasizing most of all. Give him the job and let's see if he can make great music. That's what has to happen. And they should hold him to that standard. And if he doesn't make great music, get rid of him. It's really very simple. Uh, I, I think that that's, that's the bottom line. So all of us have to take a wait and see attitude. I'm cynical, granted. I'm cynical because I know how these people operate and I see what's going on. I mean, you know, like I said, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. He's a 28 year old untested guy who is a flavor of the month classical pop star. And he's being given an orchestra, any major orchestra, the concerto about, you name it which is so much more qualified than he is. What is he in a position to tell them? They will do their professional duty. They will listen, they will do what he says, they will play what he says, but will he maintain the standard of the orchestra? Will he, will he achieve musical excellence? We'll have to wait and see. I hope he does. I mean, I'm rooting for him. I don't wish anybody failure. I really don't. But the way that these things happen is grotesque and Chicago has a lesson.
They have a history. They, this has happened to them before. They've done this before. Have they made the same mistake before? Well, we'll have to wait and see. I am not optimistic. And the reason I'm not optimistic, and I'm a very optimistic guy. I mean, I am about, you know, the health of music and all that stuff. I'm not, alpha, I'm not optimistic that he's going to be truly special. And gosh, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that he turns out to be an absolutely inspired choice. But it wouldn't surprise me if he, he, in a few years, by the time he gets there, he's completely jaded and burned out and looking for other things to do. Who knows? We don't know. We just have to wait and see and hope for the best. I do know that the recordings he's made so far have been dreadful. Um, and uh, there's a new one coming out, Petrushka and Debussy's Je in the afternoon of a fawn. Uh, clever choices in recordings because he's picking music that reveals nothing of your actual personality and that requires no emotional commitment whatsoever on the part of the conductor. Um, you know, this Stravinsky business that he's doing, it's good for you, just requires good playing. Well, he hasn't even really gotten much of that. So uh, I don't know. I just don't know what's going to happen. And I'm, I freely admit my ignorance because I cannot prognosticate. I can't say what the future is going to bring. But I do say that Chicago is, like Claudia Cassidy said, taking a risk, um, an expensive risk, a much more expensive risk than it was when Kubelik came to town. Um, and that's their choice. I, I hope it works out for them. I really do. And we shall see. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.